I'm really excited that the next session is going to be talking about digital transformation in defense, because we've always thought mm, military, they're kind of slow at doing things when it comes to digital. That's entirely changed. The landscape has changed. So luckily for us, we have Grace Cassie from Cylon. She's one of the co-founders. And luckily for us, Cylon is also one of the partners for this stage. So please, everybody, welcome Grace Cassie. And unfortunately, we can't do that in person clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. <laughs> Thanks very much, and welcome everybody to this session on digital transformation in defence. The conversation comes at a really fascinating time for UK defence. The government has recently published a high level vision for defence, security, development, and foreign policy. And this integrated review leans heavily on technology, talking in terms of sustaining strategic advantage through science and technology. And our own Chief of Defence Staff has said that the pervasiveness of information and the pace of technological change are transforming the character of warfare. So right at the top, it seems that there is a clear understanding of this changing environment. And within the integrated review and other recent documents like the Defence Digital Strategy, there is a really laudable commitment to integrating new tools, new ways of working to capture the benefits of AI, machine learning and other enabling technologies. But, and there always is a but, much of this remains a vision. And there is a significant execution challenge ahead. To turn the vision into reality, there's a lot to get right, including, I would say, bold changes to procurement, to experimentation and to new ways of working. I'm really delighted to be joined today by Major General Tom Coppinger-Sims, Director, Defence Digitisation, who is leading much of this execution work for UK Defence. His full bio is on the website. I won't list all of his considerable achievements now, so I think it will eat too much into our limited time, Tom. But first of all, thank you very much for making the time to join us today. You've got all of these issues on your plate. It's a big set of challenges. I wonder if you could start us off by setting out the challenges you see it and the tools that you have at your disposal and perhaps comment on how you go about prioritizing when you've got such a long to-do list. Great. Well, um, thank you, Grace. Thank you, Suki. Um, thanks for the introduction and, uh, and the opportunity to speak here today. And yeah, I'll, I'll try and cover some of what's a very, very wide landscape. And as you know, a very big issue. And, and Suki said that's changed. I think that's probably premature. Things are changing in defense. We're picking up speed. Uh, and as you said, there's always a big but to these things. And digital transformation is, is tough for any organization. But in UK defense, in UK government more broadly, you know, we're not just a, a we're, we're certainly not a greenfield site. We're not a brownfield site. We're more like a grade one listed building trying to change. And therefore, these, these are quite profound challenges. So I'll start with a bit of context. Uh, Grace mentioned the International um, Review of Defence and National Security. Um, and of course, that comes in a, in a background that digital disruption is not the only disruption hitting the nation uh, and defence at the time. So I'd mention others such as the rise of Asia, climate change. I mean, with that climate change, accelerated population shifts, migration, other demographic demographic changes. And of course, COVID-19 is a pretty phenomenal disruption that, um, of course, has been very negative, very difficult for us over the past year. But, you know, hopefully there'll be opportunities with that tragedy as well um, for us to, to get on the back of. So um, those disruptions are hitting everybody across the world. I'd also mention um, a return to what we might call great power competition, most obviously evidenced by Russia's increasing recklessness, but also some alarming elements of China's sort of systemic challenge to the rules-based global order. And you've heard at the G7 and the recent NATO meeting in the past few days, uh, some of our thinking on that. And then, of course, there's a continuing range of sub-state threats, um, not, to, not least uh, violent extremism in its very many forms. And of course, some of those non-state actors, those threat actors, are being exploited as proxies, if you like, by some of our state adversaries so that they can sort of threaten our values and our way of life from the shadows. But above all, I'd, by way of context, I'd come back to the, the theme which everybody in this audience will be very, very, very familiar with. And that's just the way that data-driven digital technologies and tools 
are ripping up the rules in almost every part of our lives, you know, the way we shop or vote or pray or pretty much everything. And then inevitably it's it's changing politics and it's changing conflict. So that's the that's the context. And, and hopefully uh, that's pretty well recognized by everybody. So what are we doing about it? Um, we've just re released a new strategy, which which you mentioned, um, and I'm going to really talk to the vision in that. And vision's a dangerous word, as, as Grace intimated, because it's quite easy to say some of these big things, and then it's very, very hard to deliver them. But bear with me, because you know, stating the vision is an important part and aligning everybody on that, that vision is a pretty important part too. So we use this word integrated a lot. And you know, it was an integrated review of defense and security. And defense has a thing called the integrated con operating concept. And you know, we're constantly asked, what does integrating mean? And of course, it can mean everything and nothing to as many people as want to talk about it. For me, integration really leads to one thing. And that is the outputs of the whole are greater than the sum of the parts. Or as my boss, Charlie Forte, who the, the defense CIO, but has come from an in, industrial civilian background, he just talks about one plus one equals three. So that ability, and you know it where you have seen it, where you get an organization together and the outputs are greater than the inputs. And whether that organization is defined narrowly by UK defense or by UK national security, or indeed our allies and partners, that's what we're looking for in integration. Now, clearly in the world of data and digital, integration can mean a very specific thing, but that's still what we're after. We're after that alchemy that when we allow the data to flow and reimagine the ways of working, that we get that sort of, yeah, pure alchemy, uh, you know, that, that that philosopher's stone of of more outputs than your inputs. And a lot of people will scoff at that and and say it's unachievable. A lot of us have lived in organisations that have seen it and felt it and done it, and you know it when you feel it. And and that's really what we're after. So briefly on the vision, we set out a vision where defence um, over the next ten years will value data as a strategic asset recognizing as the mineral ore that fuels our integration and enables both a system of systems and a data-centric approach, rather than our current platform-centric approach and this sort of obsession with heavy metal ships, tanks, and planes, which, which certainly I grew up with. Secondly, that we'll persistently deliver transformative digital capabilities to, a state, to enable sustainable military and business advantage. And I'm gonna come back to that in some detail if that's all right, Grace, to explain what I mean by that. Please. And then lastly, in the vision, that these capabilities will be secure, critical for us, integrated, I've already covered, easy to use is really important, as easy to use as the digital tools that we have at home that require virtually no training, unless you're over 50, in my case, um, and delivered critically at scale and pace. And, you know, Suki mentioned it, I think you alluded to it, you know, the, the slight cynicism of whether defense and maybe wider government can deliver at scale and pace in a digital age. So that's the vision. I just want to expand briefly on the military advantage bit, just to be clear, you know, what I'm talking about. So this could be what the prime minister described when in November last year, he announced what became a very generous um, spending review settlement for defense. Uh, and he spoke about a soldier on a distant battlefield who would be alerted to an ambush by satellite and uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance data, um, airplanes, if you like, data being fused and analyzed at machine speed. And then that soldier offered a, a menu of response options from an airstrike, so a fast jet overhead, uh, to a cyber disruption, to a swarm of autonomous drones to defeat or disrupt that threat, and all of that executed at the push of a button and at machine speed. So that was the sort of vision the PM spoke about. And some, some people watching will have read Christian Brose's book, The Kill Chain, and they'll recognize this sort of very, very mythologized popular image of what I would call, or what we would call the sort of aficionados in this space, would call an artificial intelligence enabled reconnaissance strike complex, you know, to see and sense something, to understand it's a threat, and then to respond to it in machine at machine speed. Now that's clearly a really important part of it. And you know, my background is good old infantry fighting in, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, or whatever else. And that's a really important part. But I just want to be clear of the breadth of our ambition, because it's not just that. It's not that sort of just that sexy end of the spectrum, if you like, or sexy to strange people like me, not to everybody, I, I, I grant you. So I could describe some other connections between sensors, effectors, and decision makers. 
And, and this is really important because many people will recognize this from their own lives or their own industries. So we could be talking about autonomous vehicles, whether they be on the land, the sea or in the air, delivering, for instance, what we would call last mile logistics, that really difficult bit when you need to get the ammunition forward in the direct fire zone. And it's not much fun risking your life to do logistics delivery. Um, the sensor there might be a, a fuel gauge in a, in a truck. Yeah, and the delivery platform, the effector, might be an autonomous vehicle. And the decision there to deliver fuel to a tank that's running out of fuel might be completely automated. There's very little ethical risk there. Um, it's very quick. It doesn't need much human intervention. Um, by the same token, that could be delivering something to the front line. It could be picking up casualties. And you know, if you see some of the advances we made in Afghanistan, what we did on the back of Chinook helicopters, I mean, properly, you know, we use the phrase world leading perhaps too much, but properly world leading interventions, saving my soldiers from horrific injuries on the back of a Chinook. Well, those will be increasingly automated where that will save time and save lives. Um, what else could it be? It could be huge sort of logistics and support fulfillment centers in the sort of theater rear area, making our logistic delivery uh, as quick as Amazon's is today. Um, going back to medical, it could be a smart pill relaying my vital signs simultaneously to the sort of paramedic who's about to cut a bit of shrapnel out of me and to the consultant surgeon who's guiding her may, maybe thousands of miles away back in one of our best NHS hospitals. Um, it could be the automated detection of malware coming in to disrupt our systems and the automated machine speed deployment of counters to that mal malware. Or it could be, for instance, the AI-enabled recognition and inception of, of hypersonic missiles, of which our big state adversaries are making a lot at the moment. Um, and they move so fast, literally around the world, that frankly, in the future, we'll have little choice but to integrate AI into all our response mechanisms. And of course, because we're shooting down a missile, not, for instance, a plane with humans in it, the ethical burden of in integrating AI into those systems is much less. So hopefully that's just given a, a range of sort of thoughts on the outputs of this digital transformation in the battle space. Now, we're all taxpayers, so I don't want to brush over the sort of business elements of this, because at one level, defense is just another, is another big corporate business. Um, we, we do different things for, for government, um, but, but essentially there's an element of us that's a sort of 45 something billion quid a year business. And clearly we can use digital transformation to allow us to run the department in a much more efficient, productive way, um, allowing people just like in any industry, allowing people to sort of rise themselves up the value chain and reduce our costs. And of course, for me as a soldier, that's hugely important because every penny that we don't need to spend on running the business, we can spend on military outputs, which means we deliver that security for the nation. So I just thought it was really worth highlighting the sort of outputs of this before we go into the discussion of, you know, how we're going to deliver that. Um, but does that get us off and That's started, Grace? Fantastic. Thank you very much. And it is an incredibly compelling vision. I think most of this audience would be um, sympathetic to the kind of use cases you're describing and the breadth of them. I think, you know, it all makes a lot of sense. I think, you know, as, as, um, as we were saying at the beginning, I think there is a little bit of scepticism about the ability to turn that vision into reality. And I wonder whether um, you know, one place to start, you mentioned yourself, some of the usability of uh, technology may not be so easy for those over 50, or you may be less familiar with certain things. Where do you, where do you think your military colleagues across the different services and functions, where do you think they stand, if you like, culturally on this change that needs to happen? Are they on board with it? Is there a, is there a process that you need to go through as defense to bring your colleagues with you on this journey? Yeah, so we all know about culture eating bits of our strategy. Um, and, and like every single sector, every other government department, every other industry I've spoken to, it's kind of yes, but no, but. So, I mean, I've just come this morning from a thing called the Digital Leadership Learning Package, where the very most senior people in defense, so those are the sort of four-star admirals and generals, but also the, um, the permanent secretary and the second permanent secretary and the key sort of um, director generals in the MOD covering policy or procurement or people or, or anything else, you know, the, the big beasts of defense. They come together once a month for about a three hour session 
um, uh, and a package that, that we're delivering with a, with a delivery partner to talk through not actually really about the technology in digital, but the ways of working, the outputs, the use cases, and what needs to be true for that to, to, to speed up. So today we happen to have a focus on sort of strategic partnerships and how our, our partnership with industry and with academia, but also with other militaries across the world and other bits of, of, of government needs to fundamentally change. And, you know, you would recognize all the themes, you know, waterfall to agile and, you know, how much of the tech stack we have to own so that, so that SMEs can come and develop in our stack so that we don't make it unachievably expensive or difficult for them to do that, where the big defense primes come in, where the big digital primes come in, and so on. And, you know, that really messy ecosystem. So so you've got the very most senior people in defense coming together, talking about these things. And, you know, we've got um, senior officials from other countries who have done this well. We've got um, SMEs coming in to talk about, you know, how they've revolutionized the Formula One industry. We've got Will Roper, who, who many people will recognize as a guy who sort of helped the US Air Force really move into, into the digital space and so on. And um, the engagement there is awesome. So from the senior leadership. Now, none of us pretend we've got all the answers. You know, any leader now who thinks they've got all the answers in this age is, is, is in a big world of pain. That's, that's what I thought leaders had when I was a kid, all the answers, because it was broadly a status quo time. Any leader who thinks they've got all the answers now is... I think probably on their way out. I hope that's not a political statement. That's a, that's a military <laughs> statement. Um, uh, so they're absolutely engaged. Now, no surprise at the bottom of our organization, the youngsters who are genuine digital natives, they enter defense. And, and I'll be entirely honest, sometimes they feel they've left the 21st century when they leave home and they enter government and defense. And this is the same in so many workplaces. So I'm not taking a pop at government or defense. And they feel like they're stepping back in time because the IT and the tech and the tools they've got at work are less advanced than the ones that they have at home to do their shopping or to speak to their boyfriend or girlfriend or partner or whatever else. So, you know, they're frustrated and they're very eager to get going. Many of them are coders to one extent or another in their, in their private time. And they're really just looking to get unleashed, but also to be given the tools that, you know, if they write a funky bit of code in one side of defense that they can hang it in a GitHub or a GitLab or other, other offerings are available and somebody else can reuse that code in their tool on the other side of defense. And then, of course, like everybody else, we've got this whacking great bit in the middle. And, uh, you know, many of them are very eager. Many of them are less eager because they've been buffeted by change for 20 or 30 years and they're a bit worn out. And for them, of course, that's where leadership comes to play. And you've got to show them what good can look like. You've got to show them how they can do what they've been doing already better. But then the great trick of all this is showing them how they can do better things, not just the old things better. Yeah. And that's the leadership challenge we all change. Absolutely. You know, I think in, in government uh, and probably elsewhere, there's a there's a phrase I'm sure we will be um, painfully aware of that trying to find low hanging fruit early on. And I wonder, um, as you think about the prioritization of working towards some of these use cases and, and um, some of the vision you talked about earlier, where do you start with this? Because to bring along some of that that middle, some of that more skeptical group, as you say, you want to be able to demonstrate to them this is how it can make a difference for you. This is how we're doing things better, more efficiently for the taxpayer, having better military effect. Where do you think the low hanging fruit, if there is any, where is it to start with? So, I mean, I've spoken about some of them already. I mean, some of the stuff that just is is there in our daily lives, why wouldn't we integrate that into what we do? And some of that can be in the corporate space, some of it can be in the battle space. I would say, though, that and, and so logistics use cases, some of the medical use cases, some of the uses of AR and VR, um, you know, they're just, there are lots. But I'm kind of, I'm a little bit uh, conflicted by quick wins and low-hanging fruit because mm. we're doing a lot of that. I mean, defense does not have an innovation problem. We have thousands of flowers blooming all over defense and national security. You know, we've got smart people who are curious and they are divergent and diverse and they think differently. They have no problems at hacking our own systems, sometimes for good and sometimes for ill. Uh, and they're dying to be allowed to do this. The, the challenge is not really the quick wins to me. And I, many of my bosses would disagree with me here. They're calling out for quick wins. I see lots of quick wins going on. The challenge we have is adopting and exploiting them, integrating them into core capability. But then having brought them into core, 
being ready to throw them away again in 18 months time, not in 18 years, in 18 months time where they're no longer relevant. So I'm a little bit conflicted about quick wins and low hanging fruit. I see a lot of it. My challenge in defense digital in, you know, in, in our strategy is doing, dare I say it, the dull stuff, the stuff yeah. that allows us to integrate them. So, you know, the two big things we're doing in our strategy, one is the defense digital backbone. So the thing that allows us to get access to our data that connects our sensors to our effectors via our decision makers, you know, between, you know, London and an operational theater, between, you know, defense and the intelligence agencies, between, you know, ourselves and our bilateral partners, you know, obviously the US and Australia and others, but also NATO, you know, our greatest strength is those partnerships. So that digital backbone connects us and allows the data to flow. And then the second strand of the strategy is this thing called the the digital foundry, a sort of federated ecosystem of innovation hubs that critically to your point, takes the quick wins, takes the low hanging fruit that, you know, maybe the army breaks through in some area in logistics, but instead of that being trapped in an army stovepipe, that innovation can travel across to the Royal Air Force or to the Navy or into our new national cyber force or into the Space Force that we announced um, earlier this year, um, or indeed back into the corporate core. And it might be a sort of human resources application that started with sort of people in green pajamas like me, but is is of equal use to the civil service. So yeah. sorry to go on so long, but it's a sort of bugbear of mine about, yeah, yeah quick wins, but, you know, yeah, we're no, a big I, I, enterprise. Yeah, I totally sympathize. And, you know, I think if I were to, you know, speak for some of the innovators who I have seen trying to work with defense over recent years, I think they would absolutely agree with your observation that innovation in and of itself has not been a problem. There are plenty of excellent innovation initiatives and it's actually relatively easy these days as, a, as an SME to do some sort of demonstrator program or to you know, get a small bit of funding to do something with some small part of the services. But as you say, it's getting beyond that into core capability that doesn't feel from an SME perspective like that's quite been cracked yet. So I think the, the digital backbone sounds like an important step yeah. on that. On that and I, was, I was never a railway enthusiast, but I suspect in the early days of rail, you know, there were little railways bursting out all over the country or, you know, if you view this in America, you know, all over the, all over America. And then it took some interventions to say, okay, slow down a bit. We got to get you all on the same rail gauge, and then we can connect you up. And then suddenly, we've got a we've got a network, we've got an yeah, enterprise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, probably railways is a bad metaphor these days. I haven't been mucked around the other day on the way to London, but you you get what I'm saying anyway. I, do, I, I get it. Yeah. Um, now, look, you know, you obviously mentioned yourself as well that you know the UK is by no means the only country grappling with this transition in the information age. And, you know, this pervasiveness of information and disinformation is pretty well understood, I think, by many of our, our key allies. I wanted just to, to note something that um, I just want to make sure that you're still there, General. You seem to have disappeared. I'm, I'm here. I, I can't see myself, but that's no bad thing. <laughs> as long as you can still hear, we can hear you. Um, so you're one of your counterparts in the US um, Armed Forces, General Dennis Krull, was commenting recently on the fact that every one of his recent exercises had demonstrated to him that time was their biggest challenge and you know it's interesting what he said was even if you can sense and make sense of your environment if you can't get information at the tactical edge in a time of relevance then it's irrelevant and it yeah. struck me that there's a very interesting challenge there between timeliness and this other word, which you, you mentioned a few times in your earlier comments, persistence. Right? We have to keep doing this stuff persistently and often against strategic adversaries who are in this for the long haul. And there are persistent grey zone campaigns that we are already engaged in and will be probably more engaged in over time. How do you think about time and the challenges of doing all of these things we have to do faster? So. Uh, there's an awful lot in that question, mm. and we don't have enough time to cover it all. Let me pick out a few threads. Um, firstly, there's that there are some really counterintuitive contrasts here between the speed at which information moves around the world, and and we all know the lie a lies you know halfway around the world before the truth's got its boots on. Um, 
then you've got the persistence of data and data doesn't lie, you know, doesn't die. Once it's out there, the truth is out there. You can hide it away for a long time, but it's going to get found. And in a, in a future world of quantum de-encryption, a lot more truths are going to get found uh, over time. So there's some contrast there. Now, you talk, talked about speed. Of course, the, the real thing that we're after here is not just speed, but it's agility, because predicting the future has become even more difficult than it, and it's always been tough even more difficult than it was before because things are changing up on us the whole time. So what we really want is agility. And that is really not just the ability to move fast in one direction, but then change our minds and move very fast in another direction without having to, to slow down too much in, in the interval. So it, it's, it's not just speed, it's agility. Um, and I'm thinking of a sporting metaphor, but I can't get to one at the moment. But, you know, so that's that, that's what I'd say. Be, beware of just speed, because with with speed, often in an industrial age, you get this sense of massive momentum. You know, the whole oil tanker is moving really fast and you kind of don't want that in the 21st century. You want to move very fast, but then be prepared to change course very rapidly. Um, so so those are just some thoughts on that. Now, clearly. When it comes to speed, um, you know, we so let, let's talk. Um, let's talk procurement and acquisition for a second. Mm -hmm. um, we we are still going to be producing heavy metal platforms for decades to come. Now, whether they have pilots and people and drivers inside them, that's a that's a whole different story. But we're going to be pressing steel for for many years to come. And I ideally hope they won't have so many pilots or, or drivers in them. And I hope they'll be ridden, you know, driven by electronic drivetrains rather than petrochemicals and so on. But but we're still going to be pressing steel. And waterfall will not go out of business anytime soon. You know, big, big programs like that are going to take decades to deliver. Um, but clearly we need the software that animates those hardware platforms to be produced at a, at a much greater speed and with much greater agility. So somehow we've got to crack this code and nobody's cracked it. You know, nobody I've spoken to overseas, inside UK, whichever industry has cracked both waterfall and agile to a degree of satisfaction. Some have done it better than others but we are wrestling with that true. And it's just plain difficult. And of course, Defense Digital, we produce not just the software, but also the tin and the string in the middle, the thing that connects the, the hardware to the software. And that sort of, you need a sort of really difficult blend, a hybrid of waterfall and agile. So we all know what we're after. We're all struggling to, to get there. Um, the digital foundry is our express intent to get there in a better way. And that's a sort of partnership with ourselves, our scientists in DSTL, and also um, defense equipment and support, the people who produce our big platforms near Bristol. Um, and that foundry will be a third way of de de delivery to try and crack exactly the problem that you're talking about and that increased speed. And, and could, you, could you comment um, a little more? You mentioned earlier about partnership with the private sector. How do you see that? integrating to use that word again yeah. with the foundry and the backbone and you, these core efforts that you'll be engaged upon how do you see the relationship with the private sector changing now, obviously there's a there's been a traditional if you like method for the private sector to engage with defense and that's typically been very long-term prime contracts and you know a sort of small number of vendors who who have the balance sheet and the patience to to engage long term with defence, how do you make it easier for the smaller players to be part of that picture? Because I know there's an intent to do that, but in reality, it can be quite hard for a, a large organisation like defence with its limitations that it has around procurement to engage meaningfully with smaller providers, not just in a kind of experimental innovation -y sort of a way, but in a in a core way. Sure. So um, it, it, it's playing tough. And look, we've been talking about this for an awfully long time. We've just released a new um, defense and security industrial strategy, which goes some way. But I, I expect just as we've issued it, we'll need to issue 2.0 pretty, pretty shortly. Um, so some thoughts on this. I mean, a lot of this is about collaboration. And, and you know, we know in every field of our lives, we're going to be collaborating, competing with people at the same time. And that's going to be the same in industry. So, you know, just as we compete with China, we're going to collaborate with China on some very big issues around the around the world. And, you know, when I speak to the big digital companies, the good old fashioned defense primes and the SMEs, there has been a change over the last year 
of the language and they accept they're going to compete with each other but they're not going to get through our doors now unless they're also collaborating and the, the clever ones you know i now go to sort of trade fairs and they're they're making a virtue of being on a stand with three or four other companies you know maybe a big digital company maybe some small smes maybe the odd startup that they're pushing the stuff and and sure you know some of the big primes are going to eat up some of those small companies and some of those small companies are going to be happy and some of them aren't going to be happy Def defense and the government is increasingly going to see where we can protect some of those SMEs so that they grow into the unicorns of the future. Mm -hmm. You know, we do want to do that as a, as a matter of national policy. We want to make sure that everything doesn't get gobbled up early on in its value cycle so that we can grow it and, and develop those strategic relationships. So I think that's a lot of it. I mean, quite a lot of it just comes down to what I'm doing today, which is strutting our stuff at these sort of conferences and trying to explain what we're trying to do and being really authentic and genuine about the, the fact that we want a different relationship and that different relationship. We do need to understand the risk that, that industry is taking and the difference in risk between a huge prime that got deep pockets and lots of lawyers and an SME that's got 150 people has just built its own HR team and has a couple of lawyers. And you know, it might be there that what defense most needs to do is, I mean, you've never been in jail before, but but I'm told by others that sometimes if you behave misbehave yourselves at night, you're offered legal aid when you when you turn up. You know, there's a lawyer provided for you when you turn up. Well, that might be what defense needs to do for some companies yeah. is offer them the lawyers to argue with our own lawyers about how we get the commercials over the or, or indeed commercial officers. So yeah. I think it's it's yeah. that understanding that's gonna drive it. Yeah, fantastic. Um, we are running out of time. I want to get a couple of questions in from the audience. Uh, so the first one is really interesting. Can there be a culture of digital innovation in the army so that changes and ideas are developed and protected by intellectual property and further that service personnel can be rewarded for their innovation? Yeah, so actually we've done this for years. Um, uh, we have a, a platform uh, called ideas now but but we've we've done it, i mean through the campaigning years um, now many of us have our suspicions that as soon as it went into because i've thrown a few ideas in and i never heard anything back other than <laughs> oh we like your idea and then sort of you see it in production so uh yeah it's a great question i'm not saying we've cracked it we have got a bunch of different things we spin ip out into the civilian sector for instance from dstl and we've got a bunch of published ways to do that we do that in collaboration across government as well, particularly in the national security mm -hmm. sector. Um, but it's really important. Um, and if you take the money away from it, I mean, the, the money's there, but can we recognize and incentivize soldiers, sailors and air people to, mm -hmm. to have good ideas and, and to trust the system that mm -hmm. will listen and do something with those good ideas? bang on and it's happening all over the so, i mean there's a brilliant little um i'll get a bit geeky now but there's a brilliant little thing to help you shoot better developed by a sergeant in my regiment really good little digital tool yeah. all sort of homegrown in production now really helping people shoot better and where i come from shooting better is good for your health right. so has it's sergeant, happening has that sergeant got a name on a patent somewhere has he been rewarded for that? that that's a great question but yes i mean i'm, I'm pretty certain he will do but he, he might be watching today so jonah if you're out there let me know the answer <laughs> to that question great thank you and um and then a question around gamification um this audience member is asking whether it's conceivable for you to develop strategic partnerships with gaming design companies to help you develop responses to some of the critical threats you're facing yeah indeed and we already have and actually bigger more senior people than me have been very public about our partnership with improbable who are a, who are a homegrown um british uh, gaming company yeah. who are doing great things and what we would call a single synthetic environment so whether you're using that environment to train in or to develop digital twins or whatever else um so with your procurement or your test and evaluation um world yeah we are doing that and and absolutely they're going to be part of the future yeah yeah um and then finally around ethics um, some of the examples that you used earlier touched on um, scenarios where perhaps the, you don't necessarily need a human in the loop, you know, the, the, the fuel refilling example that you use, for example, where you could, that could be a fully automated decision. Where does thinking stand now around human and machine teaming in more um, perhaps kinetic scenarios? Sure. So it's, it's going to certainly be part of our future. Now, even if we took a decision that we weren't going to do man-machine teaming, and that would be 
that would be madness given the range of use cases. So staying away from those fruitier ones that, that you mentioned. Um, our, our adversaries are going to bring that into our lives. So we have to be having the debate anyway. To the specifics of, of where that question is going, I mean, we have a public policy permission, which I absolutely applaud, that where we're developing lethal autonomous weapon systems, that is weapon systems that are setting out to kill people, then we will have a human in the loop. But there's some important sort of caveats in that. I spoke earlier about a hypersonic missile, you know, the sort of thing that can now travel around the world in five to six minutes that, that you need, you know, you're going to have to have AI to intervene. Now, taking a rocket out of the sky, yeah, without people on board it, that's not a lethal autonomous weapon. That's an autonomous weapon system, but it's not killing people. So the fine use cases here is going to be really important to understand. The, I mean, the, the, the code that I live by here are the same sort of codes of the laws of war that I've lived by through through my career and which have frankly stood me in very good stead. Uh, you know, I've made mistakes, but but the thing that allows me to sleep at night is that I know I made every effort not to make those mistakes and that there's a justifiable chain. Um, so that's the first thing to lock in. We make mistakes, humans. I've made mistakes that I deeply regret, but, but I've done them for the right reasons in, in the right way, dare I say it. So one of the things we need to understand is the laws of war do not stop you winning. In fact, the laws of war were defined to allow us to win, but to win well. And we will need to approach the ethics of AI, if you like, in exactly the same way. It would be profoundly unethical for us to face the future of the military without AI in our lives, because it would almost certainly guarantee that we would lose the 21st century. And that's not ethical. That would just be a bad way for my young men and women to die and a, and a useless way. So we need to engage with this ethical debate, conscious that we need to integrate these capabilities, but conscious of the very real ethical hazards that face us. And we've seen them already in our daily lives, you know, algorithms that discriminate or, um, you know, the societal effects of, um, of automation on the workforce and so on. So we certainly don't underestimate them. We've got to get on now and experiment with those sort of low, what I would call low moral hazard use cases, yeah. you know, things like logistics, as we iterate our way to those much more difficult conversations mm -hmm. that whether we raise them or not, our adversaries will raise them. I and I would project sort of sooner yeah. than we wish. And do you see a role for external stakeholders in those kind of conversations? Do you think the ethics debate is one that needs to be, um, if you like, ventilated outside of defence? It must be. I mean, you know, we, you know, the, sorry, there was a dead Prussian called Clausewitz, who, who a lot of us live by. Um, and he spoke about this sort of triangular relationship between the government, the army and the people. Um, now, redefine that for the 21st century. But you've got to have that in balance. You know, the soldiers need to trust the system you're giving them, that it will do the right thing and not harm them. Your people need to trust that what we're doing, what we're doing with our technology, reflects the values of our open, inclusive, diverse, and democratic society. And the government needs to trust that the, the equipment they're giving us is gonna protect and secure that society, our people, our interests, and our, our values. So it's got to be a very inclusive conversation. And in many ways, doesn't need to be or mustn't be driven by people in uniform. You know, it has to be a, a much more organic thing than that. And finally, just to, the privilege that I get of, um, moderating this I get to ask you the last question um you mentioned the importance of that conversation being inclusive can you tell us any more about the efforts that defense is making on diversity inclusion more broadly because of course you want part of that conversation not just around the ethics of AI but about the future of defense in general to reflect broader perspectives and I, I think I would certainly I hope the audience would like to hear more about how sure. you're going about that challenge yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll just use, um, well, I'll, I'll use two things. I mean, firstly, for those of us who doubt how inclusive and diverse we are, come and see us on operations. Now, that's a difficult offer to make because they're quite hard to get to. But, but you know, those of us who have seen us over there, and, and that idea of over there is a slightly outdated concept. But when you're on operations, you do not give a monkeys where the good idea has come from. You just want to get that good idea in service of winning your fight as quickly as possible. And when we are over there, when we're at our best, we are diverse, we're inclusive, we are 
not rank free, but we just don't mind where it comes from, whether it comes with you know long hair or short hair or a color of skin tone or a diversity, d doesn't matter at all. So that's one thing. We've got that culture in us. We need to find it when we're back here at home. The second thing, you know, where I sit in Defense Digital at the moment, if you look at the senior leadership team, it's not perfect through the whole organization. Our senior leadership team, um, divide it whichever way you will. We're about a third, you know, government employee, you know, so uniform, uniform and civil servants from defense. We're about a third civil servants from other bits of government. And we're about a third pure industry, ex-industry who've come in to join us. That's quite a lot of diversity. We're about what well, we're exactly 50-50 male, female. Now that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, but as you know, in government and in defense, that is a surprise yeah. to a lot of people. Um, we're quite pale, if I'm honest, at the sort of two and one star level, so the senior civil servant level, but we're better than that um, at, at lower levels. Um, and I, I won't go into them now, but, but we have a huge range of diversities and all the other protected characteristics within that. So I would be the last to say we've got it cracked. And I am clearly male, pale, stale, double-barreled, all, all the rest of it. I'm not, not trying to pretend I'm anything else. But, but genuinely in Defence Digital, we have access to a phenomenal range of, of diversity. And, you know, Caroline Bellamy, our chief data officer, who's come in from industry. Uh, Christine Maxwell, our CISO, effectively, who's come in from industry. Sarah Windmill, who works alongside me in the sort of accessing the corporate bit rather than the military bit, has, has come in from actually transport um, and transport police more recently. Um, I, I could go on, but, you know, we cannot be complacent, but you know, it's starting to feel really good. And and for me, that in some ways feels really challenging, but that in itself is really, really good. Good. Well, I'm delighted to hear it. And that's a really positive note on which to end. I think we've overrun a little bit, so we better draw things to a close. But Tom, thank you very, very much for taking the time to speak to us today and giving us such a fascinating insight into this big challenge that you're executing. Great. Thank you very much, Grace. And thanks, Cogex.